Hold it up and say, this is my Bible. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. And I can do what the Bible says I can do. Then I'll be taught the Word of God. And I boldly confess. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive. And I'll never be the same again. Never, never, never be the same again. What I was doing there, I was like, Make sure her phone is off, because, you know, she gets so many calls during the service. But, uh, all right. I guess I want to start out by saying hi to our friends in Oregon, Texas. Uh, huh? Yeah, Michigan, Arizona. So, hey, guys. <laughs> Yeah, the, the, the church has grown. No <laughs> no <laughs> no <laughs> Turn to Jeremiah chapter 32. Now, to, today feels like three different messages to me. So, bear with me on this. I'm kind of looking forward myself to seeing how it all ties together. So... <laughs> In Jeremiah chapter 32. It says, The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord in the tenth year of Zedekiah, the king of Judah, which was the eighteenth year of Nebuchadnezzar. For then the king of Babylon's army besieged Jerusalem, and Jeremiah the prophet was shut up in the court of the prison, which was in the King Judah's house, or the king of Judah's house. For Zedekiah, king of Judah, had shut him up, saying, Wherefore dost thou prophesy and say, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will give this city into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall take it. And Zedekiah, king of Judah, shall not escape out of the hand of the Chaldeans, but shall surely be delivered into the hand of the king of Babylon, and shall speak with him mouth to mouth and his eyes shall behold his eyes and he shall lead Zedekiah to Babylon and there shall be there he shall be until I visit him saith the Lord though you fight with the Chaldeans you shall not prosper and Jeremiah said the word of the Lord came unto me saying Behold, that Hananel, the son of Shalom, thine uncle, shall come unto thee, saying, Buy thee my field that is in and off, for the right of the redemption, right of redemption is thine to buy it. So Hanamiel, my uncle's son, came to me in the court of the prison, according to the word of the Lord, and said unto me, Buy my field, I pray thee, that is in Anoth, which is the country of Benjamin, for the right of inheritance is thine, and the redemption is thine. Buy it for thyself. Then I knew that this was from the word of the Lord. Now, I kind of want to stop here, just real quick. This starts out by saying, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, correct? I mean, that's verse 1 says that. And then as you move through the process here, he had a word that was against the current the current ruler, correct? Didn't like that, so he threw him in prison. So then the word of the Lord came unto him again, saying, You're gonna, I want you to buy this land. So to verify that word, it actually happened, correct? Okay, so. God is establishing credibility because there's been many times that we've all heard something from the word of the Lord that might have gone against popular culture or against a current trend but you follow God's word in that and then he's proved himself right D different scenarios in our lives and in verse 9, he says, I bought the field of Hananel, my uncle's son, that was in Anthoth, and, and weighed him the money, even 17 shekels of silver. 
And I subscribed the evidence and sealed it and took witness and weighed him the money in the balances. So I took the evidence of the purchase, both that which was sealed according to the law and custom, and that which was open. And I gave the evidence of the purchase to Barak, the son of Nira, the son of Messiah, in the sight of Hanamiel, my uncle's son. And in the presence of the witnesses that subscribed the book of the purchase before all the Jews that sat in the court of the prison. And I charged Barak before them, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, God of Israel, take these evidences, this evidence of purchase, both which is sealed and this evidence which is open, and put them in an earthen vessel, that they may continue many days. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, houses and fields and vineyards shall be possessed again in this land. Now when I had delivered the evidence of the purchase of the bark and southern ear, I prayed to the Lord, saying, and, and oh, just catch this. Ah, oh, Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power, and stretched out arm, and there is nothing too hard for thee. Thou showest loving kindness unto thousands, and recompense the iniquity of the fathers into the bosom of their children after them. The great, the mighty God, the Lord of hosts is his name. Great in counsel, and mighty in work, for thine eyes are open upon all the ways of the sons of men, to give everyone according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings, which has set signs and wonders in the land of Egypt, even to this day, and in Israel, and among other men, and has made thee a name as at this day, and has brought forth thy people Israel out of the land of Egypt with signs and with wonders and with strong hand and with outstretched arm and with great terror, and has given them this land which thou didst swear to their fathers to give them, a land flowing with milk and honey, and they came in and possessed it, but they obeyed not thy voice, neither walked in thy law. They've done not, nothing of all that thou hast commandest them to do. Therefore thou caused all this evil to come upon them. Behold the mounts, they are come unto the city to take it. And the city is given to the land of the Chaldeans that fight against it. Because of the sword and of the famine and of the pestilence. And what thou hast spoken has come to pass. Behold, thou seest it. And thou hast said unto me, O Lord God, buy thy field for money and take witnesses to the city is given to the land of the Chaldeans. You realize what that just was? That that was his prayer. He was taught. I mean, we, we, think about the Lord's Prayer for a second. You know what it says, Our Father, go in heaven, hallowed be thy name, that special, holy, and consecrated. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What is he saying to the Lord here? This is a, an example of prayer. He's first of all coming to God humbly, and then he's reminding God and acknowledging everything that he's done. And so many times people forget to do that when they approach God. That they, they approach him like, hey God, I need this, I need this. Could you take care of this for me? Instead of what he's done here is he's acknowledging to him everything that he's done and reminding him and himself of all the things that God has done, all the things that he's brought people out of, all the promises that he's made, and acknowledging his name in that. I mean, when we, we think about the part that we're reminding ourselves of this. But in the culture we live in today, we never approach God with the idea that God, you are the king of heaven and earth. You're the creator. And we, we kind of minimize the holiness of God. 
and the awesomeness of God because he's allowed us in so closely. You know? You, you ever heard the expression, familiarity breeds contempt? Okay, when you get so familiar with somebody, you can kind of start to lose respect for them because you know all their little things, their little little personal things that they do or don't do or or whatever. And, but God has allowed us into that part of him of all the personal things of who he is. And to get so familiar with it because we're children of his that we actually sometimes forget to honor him. Because make no mistake, kids or not, we're going to stand before him someday. And he's still the one that passes judgment. He's still the one that determines eternity for us. I mean, there's that part of him too. And I just see people just kind of lose inside of that. There, there was a <laughs> I wrote down a couple of just thoughts this morning. When the conscious mind and the unconscious mind are not working in tandem or with each other, you're double minded. Your conscious mind is approximately 10% of your thought process. And the subconscious mind encompasses the rest. In other words, what we're aware and conscious of and thinking about, that, that's 10% of what's really going on in us, of our, of our conscious mind. Now think about what the subconscious and the unconscious mind does. That's where our emotions get checked from time to time. Because unconsciously, I'll react to something that she says or does. Just unconsciously. I'm like, that bothered me. Why don't you I might not say anything. Because I'm smart. <laughs> But I still unconsciously or subconsciously, either one, know that something is set right. Yet consciously, I'm in love with her. I, I want to please her. I want to make her happy because, as we all know, if mama ain't happy, nobody's happy, right? <laughs> Husbands were going, oh, yeah, that's what I want. But the part that I recognize in my conscience is the part that I really kind of have to deal with in that moment. But if I do only that, then I'm neglecting the other 90%. Why did that bother me? What is it that, you know, the, the things that the... the questions that we ask ourselves are like, why did that bother me so much? What was it about that that just felt wrong? And it's not even a confrontation thing now. Have you ever looked at something or something happened and you're like, I don't know, that didn't sit right with me. And you don't know why? That's the other 90%. That's your spirit man. That's the things that you've been taught that have been taught wrong or they've been taught correctly but now you're hearing it wrong and you're like, wait a minute, that just doesn't sit right. Something about that. Because, you know, we all had to unlearn things that we've been taught. I mean, we all have. So, to recognize that that double mind mindness part and we'll look at Something familiar in a second. 
It's both the conscious and the unconscious or subconscious mind. It's both. Both of them are parts of the mind, correct? I know I'm just, ugh, I'm not going to be able to get this across, but I'm really hoping and expecting that each one of you everywhere will look at this and consider this. And it's like, okay, God, what does that mean? How, how does that affect what I do on a, in day to day? It's easier to fool a man than it is to convince him that he's being fooled. Say that again. It's easier to fool somebody than it is to convince them that they've been fooled. Because to convince them that they've been fooled, now they've got to deal with all those internal subconscious things. Their pride. Yeah, they go, I thought I was smarter than that. Can't believe that. So to get somebody to admit that, you know what? I was wrong. I, uh, you tricked me. Sucker me into that one. And you know the expression, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. Because the second time you have to take responsibility for your part in not recognizing the deception. Right? So it's along those lines of getting us to admit that God, we're, we've taken you for granted in our approach to you, in your holiness. We've been fooled and tricked by the freedom of who we are in Christ. Doesn't take away from that, okay? It doesn't take away from the access that we have to him. It doesn't take away from any of that. It doesn't take away from that as he is, so are we in this world. It doesn't take away from any of that. But to lose sight of who he is in the process, when he speaks to us and then validates it, then to approach him without realizing and recognizing God you are God and I, I don't think we get caught up in that, in that part of it it would be like Samuel forgetting that you're his dad when it comes to discipline and order and repercussions of that I mean, there, there's a certain way that we approach it. Even though we've got complete access. I mean, how would you feel if you said, hell, man. I'm getting a new game for my iPad, so, you know. I mean, you <laughs> be like, boy, have you lost your mind. <laughs> you know. Or, or, you know, just use that as a silly example of that. Or, or, or hey, old lady. You know. <laughs> Not that you're there with you. Or yours. <laughs> but can you imagine them forgetting who you are when they approach you? And don't you teach them and train them and what we taught and trained as children? If you want something, it's easier to get things with honey than it is vinegar, right? Not that we're trying to get anything necessarily, but it's the approach is everything. You know, we, we were kind of teasing the other day about, on my birthday I bought something, and uh, but it was something I just bought, you know. And it's like, well, do you ask me about it? What do you think about that? Well, you know, that, that's kind of a conversation. Well, I was like, no, I didn't ask her. I bought it. You know, I mean, it wasn't like a house or anything that, you know, depleted all our finances to get or put us in harm's way to get or anything like that. They said, what about her? I said, look, 
she does the same thing. I don't know until Amazon shows up. <laughs> you know, but she's done that, so, uh-uh, no, no, damn <laughs> hmm, That rang true to a lot of people here. Okay, well, that's a good example. But it, it's that same thing, but, but when I do approach her with something that I want, that kind of leaves her agree with her decision on, the way I approach her determines the process of the outcome, doesn't it? I'm trying to choose my words and guard my words so carefully on this because I'll be in so much trouble with my life. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I've got to say this, and, and this is really personal, and I know it's it, it's it's a, a such a compliment to you. This morning, to, this morning before we got here, when she got up, she wasn't really feeling well. She was coughing, and, and it wasn't pretty, was it? <laughs> and there was a part of me in that moment that was like. Should I ask her, or do you just want to stay home? Because she wasn't, I mean, she, it was, it was, you can ask her all the details of everything if you want. So there's one of the situations where she maybe should, could have or should have. But when I was about to, I felt the Holy Spirit say, don't you dare. Don't you dare. I'm doing something. Like that. Okay? So for me, to give her that out in that moment, although I seem to be a little insensitive. Did you even consider that I was insensitive or didn't care or didn't notice or anything? But it, all of that stuff is like, God said he's doing something with her in that. And as near as I can tell, you're better. Okay, I mean, there's no evidence of what she went through earlier before she made the decision to be here. No evidence whatsoever of that. Because it was obvious. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it just was. And it's the same principle with the things of God like this. To not forget who he is. And to know in that who we are, but once we decide that we're going to honor him for who he is, he kind of takes care of who we are at that time. And I'm so pumped on you. I mean, and I don't mean that because I saw a level of faith and decision today. It's like, yes, that's what I'm talking about. So, anyway, just want to put that out there. That's what I think I'm going to get in trouble for later, is it? I need this on record, yes or no. <laughs> and in verse 26, it says, Then came the word, the word of the Lord unto Jeremiah, saying, Behold, I am the Lord God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? So, now he's talked to him, right? Jeremiah's talked to the Lord, God, God, you're great, God, I thank you, here I'm doing this and this. And then God responds. Is there anything too hard for me? Therefore, thus saith the Lord, behold, I will give this city into the hand of the Chaldeans, and into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and he shall take it. And the Chaldeans that fight against this city shall come and set fire upon this city and burn it with houses, or with the houses, upon whose roofs they've offered incense to Baal. Woo! Yeah. And poured out drink offerings unto other gods to provoke me to anger. So he's not just acknowledging that they worshiped other gods. He's not just acknowledging that they've got on their rooftops and just been openly blatant. But now he said the reason they did this was to provoke him to anger. Last week, I don't even know what night it was, 
but I believe it was the Grammys. Did people hear about that? That thing there? Now see, if that provokes you, good. But the thing is, they did that to provoke God. Okay. Oh, it was just a, the devil just being him. I'm not going to go into all that now, but good. No need there. And I'm going to put this out there, too. It was sponsored by Pfizer. Yeah. 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 Pfizer. Well, what else did they sponsor? Oh, yeah. But what they were doing in that, they were provoking God. They did that. It's like, who, who are you and what are you going to do about it? Well, they're going to find out what he's going to do about it. This country's going to find out what he's going to do about it. And I think a lot of people believe we're going to get popped in the process. Pun intended. <laughs> See, some people got that. <laughs> but it's like they did this to provoke him to anger. Verse 30, for the children of Israel and the children of Judah have only done evil before me from their youth. For the children of Israel have only provoked me to anger in the work of their hands, says the Lord. For this city has been unto me as a provocation of mine anger and my fury from that day that they built it, even unto this day, that I should remove it from my face. See, a lot of people think that when God shows up on the scene and fixes things in the only way that he can, sometimes dramatically and aggressively, it's not because he's mad necessarily, or at least that's something. Oh, the result of it. Oh, okay, I didn't say that correctly, but follow me on this. He addresses those things, Psalm of the morning. He removed it from his face. You know how we're always talking about don't put any unclean things in front of you? Remove it from your face. God's saying remove it from your face because that's what he does. But when he removes it from his face, well, considering he sees everything and knows everything, in order for him to remove it from his face, doesn't it have to cease to exist? Whereas with us, we just turn the channel or decide not to watch it in the first place or whatever in that. But when God decides to remove it from his face, it's gone. Just like our sins. As far as the east is from the west, he's removed them from us. He's removed it from him. So they're gone. And then verse 32, because of all of the evil of the children of Israel and the children of Judah, which they've done to provoke me to anger. Once again, all the evil that they did. They didn't do it just because they're ignorant or rebellious necessarily. They did it to provoke him. <laughs> I, I really, even as a believer in the Son, say it like this. I'm absolutely terrified to provoke him to anger toward me. You know? I mean, it doesn't mean he doesn't love me. You ever been mad at your kids? Because they just kept picking and picking and picking and they provoked you to anger? Yes, he has. <laughs> 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 John looked at like, he ever had to see Yeah. But 
And then once they, their anger's there, what happens? Now think about God. And, and please understand that this, God is love, yes. God is holy also and righteous and just. And right now the voice seems to be, don't forget who he is. Because of all of the everything that's happening in the world. Whether it be the earthquakes in Turkey and Syria, which is prophetic, yes. I'm not saying this will be some, because in 99, 70,000 people died of an earthquake there. So this is just one more event, okay? So don't think, well, he doesn't realize it. Yeah, I did. But realize that the earth is groaning for this. The people of the planet have provoked God. Am I necessarily saying he's causing this? As far as like, well, now I'm going to. No, this is always in place. This is just where we're at in the time frame of it right now. It's something that was always going to be there because he knew how evil man would be. He knew how blatant man would be. And and to think why he doesn't just zap the people that taught him. Because we would, wouldn't we? Uh, I mean, you know, if if I was God and that thing happened at the Grammys like that, I bet, oh, zap, there, you're gone. But it's not who he is. It's not what he, that there are things in place that he's already put in place that are going to take care of that. But the more vile and evil this and blatant this stuff becomes, just go the closer he is. And their kings, their princes, their priests, and their prophets, and the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And they have turned unto me the back and not the face. Though I taught them rising up early and teaching them, yet they not hearken to receive instruction. But they sent their abominations in the house, which is called by my name to defile it. Yeah, now he, I mean, he kind of makes it clear who he's talking to, isn't he? And they built high places of Baal, which are in the valley of the son of Hinnon, and to cause their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire unto Molech. Isn't that what they're doing right now? With this mutilating the children? Is that not causing and making the children pass through the fire? I mean, which I commanded them not, neither came it into my mind that they should be this abomination to cause Judah to sin. And now, therefore, thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning this city, wherever you say, it shall be delivered into the hand of the king of Babylon by the sword and by the famine and by the pestilence. Behold, I will gather them out of all countries, whither I have driven them in my anger and my fury. And in great wrath, I will bring them again into this place, and I will cause them to dwell safely. And we know he's talking about Jerusalem, right? Okay, we, we get the reference there. And they shall be my people, and I will be their God. And I will give them one heart and one way. Why? That they may fear me forever people are like oh God could give them one heart yeah why is that and the word fear there just means reverence that they may fear me forever for the good of them and their children after them you know the old expression that's going to hurt me more than it does you I don't 
actually know if that was true. I got spanked, but you know, but they said it. And I will make an everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn away from them. To do them good, I will put my fear in their hearts that they shall not depart from me. Yea, I will rejoice, rejoice over them to do them good. And I will plant them in this land assuredly with my whole heart and with my whole soul. Now this is God talking. For thus saith the Lord, like I brought all this great evil upon this people, so I will bring them all the good that I promised them. And fields shall be bought in this land where you say, it is desolate without man or beast. It's given to the land of the Chaldeans. Men shall buy fields for money and subscribe evidences and seal them and take witness in the land of Benjamin and the places about you, Jerusalem. And in the cities of Judah, the cities of the mountains, and the cities of the valley, and the cities of the south. For I will cause their captivity to return, says the Lord. And then in verse 33, or chapter 33, he gets another word. Jeremiah's going through some stuff here. And how many of you know it's probably not an easy word to give? Because remember the first time he gave the word, what happened to him? He got put in the pokey, right? Because it was against somebody that had authority in civilization. Now, turn to James, the book of James, chapter 1. Because we're going to look at this in context with the other things we're talking about. Have you ever heard the expression that a problem defined is a problem solved? Or half solved? Because if you can define a problem, you're halfway there to fix it, right? I mean, we just got through getting that water leak face out the side here the third time on that same run. You know, which maybe this will be the last time in our lifetime. Who knows? Once we define where the leak was coming from, that's halfway to getting it fixed. In our own lives, too, once we can define a problem, we're halfway to solving it. And that's what I'm kind of trying to do today is define that or at least give us a bridge and some tools to help us define it. Because going back to what Dee went through this morning and the decision she made, she defined the problem. Okay? But then once she made the decision of what had to be done to solve it, now it's fixed. And we, so, wow, man, I'm just, so many validations and lessons that I, I get from her. Hmm. Okay, in James chapter 1, verse 1, it says, James, the servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, green. Now, let, let me address something here real quick. There's... You know, the last scripture was talking about Israel and all that, right? Now, nobody has a problem with saying that, oh, well, we're, we're in spiritual history. You know, because we're back then now to the kingdom, to the kingdom of Israel, so we're, we're spiritual history. When it suits well, the, the blessing part of it. You know, they're like, wait a minute, I'm, no, I'm, a, I'm a child of God, so I have a spiritual Israel and on the blessing side. Now, on the other side, too, you can't not have it the other way, too. It's kind of like Deuteronomy 28. Everybody likes to talk about the first 16 verses where it's all the blessings, all the blessings. But the next 40 verses, basically, are, but if you don't do this, it's going to happen. If you don't do this, if you don't do this, if you don't do this. So don't exclude yourself from this if you don't, in, or if you include yourself 
and all the blessings and promises. Okay? I mean, being your son and daughter can't just be all happy times, right? It's got to be both. Well, not to give some of happy times. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith works, worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work. That you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let them ask of God that gives to all men liberally and upbraid not, and it shall be given unto him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavers is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Remember what we're talking about, that double-minded? The 10% the conscious mind, and then the 90%, and those percentages are probably subjective to the person. Okay, it's not just, you know, I mean, D operates in probably 70% of her mind. <laughs> Consciously and aware of it. <laughs> I'm just playing. But let that man not think he'll receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted. But the rich... In that he's made low, because as the flower of the grass, he shall pass away. <clears throat> For the sun is no sooner risen with the burning heat, but it withered, withered the grass, and the flower therefore falls, and the grace and the fashion of it perish, perishes. So shall all the rich man fade away in his ways. He's not saying that it's. There's not a place that you're just going to flourish and bloom. But if you rest in that and depend on that place of blooming, just realize the petals also fall. There's a season there. there there's a, was that Easter lily or Christmas lily? Or whatever. There, there's this flower or plant that she has that she thought was dead then all of a sudden it seemed like overnight it sprouted this big old bloom hadn't opened yet has it but just about you know she thought it was dead and then it propped up and now it's got this thing on it that is just about ready to be is it the season for it to do that a little past the season. But the times that she was going to throw it away, she kind of talked herself out of it. For whatever reason, to give it more time, to give it a chance, or I don't know, just hope. But now it's got this bloom on it that's about to pop out and do something. That's Lance or her thing, not, not really mine. I'm both the grass. But when it does bloom, bless you. It's just going to be there for a little while, isn't it? And then it dies, or at least the bloom dies, that part of it dies. And then does that same one come back the next year? If you do it right. <laughs> okay, I like that, if you do it right. And then verse 12 it says, Blessed is the, man, is the man that endures temptation. Now, I looked up that word. Now, this word here, temptation, is listed with this definition only like two times. And it says, it means putting to prove by experiment. 
putting it to proof by experiment or adversity. So blessed is the man that endures being put to proof by experiment. For when he's tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to them that love him. So the crown of life is only promised to them that love him, right? Let no man say when he's tempted, I'm tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil. Neither tempts he any man. But every man is tempted, and, and that word there, tempted, is to be tested, scrutinized, or proved. When he's drawn away of his own lust, and if you look up the word lust there, It's a longing for what is forbidden. Because you think about lust, you just, you know, well, whatever it is you think about. Okay. But the definition of lust there is a longing for something that's forbidden. You get people that they've been set free of things, will say they have. And yet they continue to long for that. Continue to long for the thing that they've been set free of. And then just basically lust. And then when it's conceived, it brings forth sin. And sin, when it's finished, brings forth death. And then in verse 16, he just breaks it down. Don't err, my brethren. You know, the, the, the whole Bible could probably be written with just those words. Here's God's word for you. Don't err, my brethren. And if we'll just do that, and then again, he's got to put the rest of it in there because we don't know what's right or wrong without this. Because they call evil good and good evil. And, uh, you, know, you just don't know. So to ensure that we don't err, he's put this in here and then flip over back a few pages to 2 Timothy. And while you're finding 2 Timothy chapter 3, I heard an interesting commentary. You know, how everybody was this balloon, this Chinese balloon that had, you know, like all that equipment on it, and they're worried about it being spied here, right? Somebody commented, and it made sense to me. I, I'm not saying it wasn't spied here, it was spied here. Don't really care. Okay? That's beyond my pay grade. But, but he brought this question up. Do we not have aircraft from these various countries coming into our airports at all times? I mean, you've got them coming from Australia, from China, from England, from everywhere, right? Who's to say that that doesn't have similar spyware on it? So they're so worried about a single balloon, and yet every day, Planes and aircraft are invited to just fly over and land and, and do all that. All of it. So <coughs> instead of just wondering what they might have got on that balloon, what kind of information they might have gleaned there, have you ever looked at the flight patterns? of the FAA at any given time if you pull that up over the United States how many airplanes and stuff are flying over and some of those are foreign aircraft now it's not the scary but we're not scared of that right it's just to give you another perspective of what they brought so much fear about 
that guys, that was just one thing that was made aware of that could be or couldn't be that maybe it was so what. But these other things are happening every day. So if you're going to be concerned about that, don't be. You just need to know Jesus. You know, those things are going to happen regardless. In chapter 3, this know also that in the last days, perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves. Covenants, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, and un unholy. And it's kind of interesting that deal with the Grammys, that was the name of the song that is called Unholy. And I'm not saying this is that, but it's that too. Without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures, more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such, turn away. And what is the power thereof? It's the power to be like him because you've accepted him. That's the only reason. It's not to be like him without accepting him and submitting to him. And you know, when I, when I start, God, there were so many places, the form of godliness, where he's, he, we're told that we've got authority on this earth, that we've been called and commissioned to, sub, to subdue this planet and the things on it. And the greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world, but we have the power to decide when something comes on us if we're going to accept it or not. That is, if that's not a form of godliness, I don't know what it is. I am not to steal it. And then he says, from such turn away, for this is, for of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captivity silly women laid with sins, led away by diverse lust, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Janice and Jeffries withstood Moses, so do these also that resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. They're not just reprobate minds, they're reprobate concerning the faith. But they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs also was. But that was fully known by doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch and Iconium, at Lystra. What persecutions I endured, but out of them all. The Lord delivered me. Yea, all that will live godly in Christ, Jesus, shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Huh. I guess man didn't really write it. It was given by inspiration of God. And is profitable for doctrine which means teaching 
for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. See, Scripture is where we get our instruction for righteousness. I mean, we don't get it nowhere else. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall heap unto themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Wow. That's a lot, isn't it? This is the only hope humanity has is in this book. That's it. That's the only instruction of righteousness there is. Now, having said that, let me qualify. You know, earlier when we were reading the Old Testament, Jeremiah, he mentioned the, the, the name Barak. Well, if you want to learn about that, there is a book of the Bible called Barak. It wasn't put in these 66. But it's a legitimate book. There are other letters. I mean, doesn't the Bible say that we're epistles written of all men? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this is where people kind of go off into some kind of a... But these are letters and books that we're epistles read of all men because we promote Jesus. We promote his gospel. We promote his death, burial, and resurrection. We promote that he's the only way to God. But, but just realize that in these 66 books that we have here, it's everything you need. For instruction in righteousness. And anything, anything, letter, book, teaching, that takes you away from who he is and his holiness and his awesomeness, disregard it. Now they're, they're like, well, what about this? What about this one? You know what? I don't have these memorized yet or even done everything that's in these and I haven't gotten everything out of this yet. I've been studying this for 40 years. I don't necessarily need to look at those others. But if you come across something like that, check it out historically. I don't say just disregard everything because if that's the case, then you would disregard everything I say. Even though I'm teaching out of this. Right? Be open to what God is telling you. But make sure it lines up with what we already have. Make sure it's consistent with what we already have. It's kind of like Andrew Wright's books, right? Some of the revelation that he gives and others, I'm just mentioning him, is as much instruction in righteousness as the book of Second Kings. That you can glean from that and it helps you walk closer to God. It helps you be more like him. And I I kind of feel like I'm veering into an area that I can't 
don't have the time to validate right now. So I'm going to just step away from that. Everything you need right now. And then we have each other. And right now, we need each other. I've got a quick question. Is, are your chickens still producing eggs? You're not feeding Purina, are you? Ah, that's why. There, there's a, a friend of ours uh, who's grown quail and things like that. He's been feeding Purina, which is, is that a subsidiary advisor? Yeah. Or, or, yeah, but anyway. Chicken will stop producing eggs that are being fed that stuff. So watch what you feed. The chicken, you heard about that? Okay. So it, it's a it's a legit thing. And they they talked about part of the reason for that. And yeah, here I right at the end I mean good old conspiracy. <laughs> well it's a conspiracy if it's true. But they're saying that part of the reason for that is they're getting them sterilized so you're not going to be able to have those options anymore. Okay? What is it that they're starting to promote? They being, you know, the world, yeah, artificial food, bugs. Fake meat, you know, we talked about that a while back about impossible meat. And then the Bible where it talks about how in the last days they'll be commanding you to abstain from this. If it's not available because they've taken it out, isn't that commanding you not to do it? Isn't it the same thing? Just guard this stuff. Keep making your own feed or whatever you're doing. Keep doing it if they're not being affected. But lots of people, some of them I know, their eggs are being affected just by the brands that they're feeding them. Anyway, that's just for free. Research it, check it out, and see what conclusion you come up with. Father, I thank you for who you are. God, you are great and mighty. You are the creator of the universe, heaven and earth. We honor you, Lord, and we bless you. And Father, I thank you that you continue to bless your people, lead and guide them into all truth. God, thank you for including us in your heart. Amen.